Hi, I'm Matt. Hi, I'm Robbie. Uh, we want to talk to you today about uh, sustainable BDD practices. This talk was originally titled, uh, It's Not Your Test Framework, It's You, but we thought that made us sound like jerks and like we were blaming you for something. And we are blaming you, but we didn't want to come off as jerks right off the bat. So, new title. So, um, so we've kind of really noticed this hype cycle in uh, with BDD. You know, there was a kind of a, a really uh, aggressive kind of adoption curve. People were kind of starting to get on board with it, uh, really happy with it. Lots of tools kind of coming out, and then they started to kind of peak and it started to go down a little bit. People started to kind of get down on it, started blaming the tool, started saying, "Why are we doing this? We don't need automated acceptance testing." So, we've kind of been on uh, on a bit of a journey, and uh, we kind of want to talk about some of the some of the points which people are talking about, like why they d have stopped doing BDD. Yeah, I mean, that's the real question, like, uh, what, what, what's really going wrong and why are we feeling this pain? So, uh, we, we see a few things, uh, we'll talk about them, brittle tests, um, developers writing acceptance criteria, uh, unreadable tests, flickering tests, slow tests. Um, I think, though, uh, something we have to get out of the way first is uh, making sure we're all on the same page about what we're talking about. I know when I... Uh, started um, doing BDD, I had no idea what I was doing, and, and I just was reading blog posts and learning about tools and trying things out without really understanding some of the deeper intentions behind this. Uh, this is called cargo culting. If you don't know what that term means, I won't tell you the story. Check it out on Wikipedia. It's, it's definitely an interesting read, but basically we're just saying you're, you're basically adopting or copying um, a methodology or a process or a technology without really understanding it. Right, exactly. So you've just kind of brought it in. Um, you know, you just dropped it into your development environment, you tried to run it, and, you know, maybe you, you haven't asked the right questions, you're not doing the right way. But, you know, even before that, we kind of have to take a step backwards and kind of look at how we kind of got into this mess in the first place. And it, it kind of really starts with, uh, with unit testing and the kind of small talk community starting to do unit testing and, and kind of patterns developing out of that. And the, the kind of main one was XUnit, which kind of... Uh, developed into J unit and N unit and lots of other tools, and you know these these kind of practices were used at kind of multiple layers. They were used for like real unit tests, for um, integration tests, for and some kind of very primitive automated tests as well. Right, but um, this guy Dan North came along, and he he's the guy that coined the term behavior driven development, and um, he said, guys, what if we kind of turn this on on our on its head? Because we're we're doing things now. We're still kind of have this very inside out pattern of the way we do uh, test driven development, yet. Uh, we have now these practices that we're starting to gel on um, that we work out with our product owners uh, called specification by example. Um, and our tooling doesn't really, doesn't really match this process. It doesn't, it doesn't, these two things aren't really connecting. So what can we do about that? Right, so kind of let's just step through an example. So I'm a kind of product manager and I come on and say, okay, we're gonna build this web app and you know, we need sign in. So just do it, please. Yeah, sure. I've done that a million times. I'll just run off and install device and we're done. But you know that's kind of not. That's what you know. That's the wrong approach, right? We shouldn't be doing that. We should say, okay, you know, trivial as it sounds, give me give me an example, and uh, maybe you kind of wrestle with your product manager a little bit, and you kind of come up with some kind of wordy way of saying like, okay, so the user opens an app, they put in a username, a password, an email address, um, they're signed in straight away, and they uh, you know they can start using the application straight away. Okay, so what you really should say at this point is thanks, and that gets us started, but that's not enough. Let's give this a name. Let's call this the valid username, email, and password example. Um, I think any developer in this room worth their salt would look at that and say, okay, well, what do we do when it's invalid? What, what, what are all the ways this can go wrong? Right, so kind of let's look at a few kind of canonical um, cases where there is invalid, and probably the, the basic one is going to be kind of where they're, where they're blank. You know, and so if someone doesn't enter a username, doesn't enter a password, what do we do? Well, I mean, it's probably quite simple, right? We're not going to submit the form. We're going to display an error message. But, you know, we've got another use, use case kind of nailed down. Um, we can go farther, though. Like, what, what happens when the password and the password confirmation don't match? Uh, your, your product owner may, may look at you and say, oh, we'll just tell them they didn't match and make them try again. Or they may say, why do we need a password confirmation? Why do I care? There's lots of applications out there now that when you sign up, you don't have to have a password confirmation. If you don't have this conversation with your product owner, you're not going to figure out whether or not they value robustness of a sign-up process 
over speed of entry into the application. And kind of moving on from that, if we start kind of probing these security questions, it's like we could ask, you know, uh, what about the password uh, security kind of length? You know, is it important that it's really strong? Are we dealing with uh, sensitive information, or is this just like a kind of little application where people can go in and maybe just leave a comment on something? And again, we're kind of asking the question, uh, the underlying question here is kind of security versus convenience. And unless you start asking these questions, we're just going to make assumptions about what the product owner really wants. Uh, moving on, another thing we might say is, well, what do we do if the email address is invalid? And maybe in your head you're thinking, what if you know, the, the format of the email doesn't match an RSC822 compliant email? But your product owner is probably not thinking that. He may think, uh, oh, right, yeah, if the email bounces, what should we do in that case? And that was like, oh, that wasn't what I meant. Oh, but I see what you're saying now, and maybe that is important, and maybe you do value that. You don't know until you ask them, until you have this conversation. And we can kind of push this one step further. We can say, what about if the username is unavailable? And there's, there's kind of a bunch of use cases why a username might be unavailable. It might be a reserved word. It might have to go through like a profanity filter. Or it may be that, you know, you've already signed up for this service and you just forgot. So maybe that asks the questions of like, well, if, if it is you, how do you kind of recover that account and get back in? Uh, which is going to lead us to a whole other feature. Now we have to talk about account recovery and, and what do we do in situations where they remember some things or what if they've forgotten everything? Do we, do we have any kind of plan for that or do we care? Are they just out of luck? Uh, you need to talk about it. Th again, you, know, you, you need to have this conversation with your product owner. It doesn't mean that you're going to do all this stuff right away, but uh, you should at least like, flesh this idea out. Right, and kind of what about if I've signed up for this service, but I've used Matt's email address for some some reason? You know, does that matter? Am I allowed to go straight into the application, or no. does Matt have to? Thanks. <laughs> does Matt have to? Uh, you know, verify that, which kind of leads us to a whole new thing about kind of verification. Am I even allowed to access the application until I've verified? Or what about if I use Matt's email address and he reports it as a fraud? You know, then what happens? So you know, and again, we're not asking these questions, and we're not discovering what the product needs to be. Uh, and we can't talk about any of these features without, of course, talking about sign-in. Because uh, you can't sign up without sign-in, right? So again, what do we do in all these different scenarios? Let's talk about it. Right, so kind of after this discussion, you know, we've had a very simple kind of one-sentence uh, feature, which we just said at the beginning, hey, we're just going to drop in device, no drama. Um, but it's really kind of extracted out to four features, 17 scenarios. And you know, we could probably have digged a little bit deeper. But I think for the purposes right now, I think we're kind of all set. This process that uh, agile practitioners like Dan North were doing uh, was, was not only unearthing like hidden complexity, and uh, it was also helping software developers understand what their product owners want better and what they actually value. And uh, it, it's a tool to do that. It's, it's a way to have a conversation to draw that information out. But again, there was no, there was no good tooling at the time to, to line up with this process. So Dan North created a, something called jbehave, and um, it was really the first BDD tool out there, uh, which was somewhat successful, but it really started to ask people to think about terminology like business value and to start using words like features and scenarios uh, and to come up with a, a bit of a common language that we can share with our product owners that had some mapping with what we were doing in our TDD. Right, and then kind of Dan North started to turn his hand to, uh, to Ruby and he kind of ported, uh, ported that over to, to Aspec. Um, the Aspect, sorry, to uh, our behave, the Aspect team kind of adopted that and pulled that into um, into Story Runner, which was a really kind of critical moment for BDD because this was the first time where we've taken those stories and put them into plain text files. Yeah, I mean that that was that was a milestone, and and now you had a plain text file that you could write collaboratively with your product owner that that wasn't in a place of code that that scared them. It was in a place where you all had, I think, a equal footing. Right, um, and then the guy who kind of created Cucumber came along, wanted to contribute, couldn't for, for various reasons, so he pulled that out and actually kind of created Cucumber. And again, this is another really important step because through Cucumber we have Gherkin, which is a kind of language specification uh, library which is kind of used um, to specify state diagrams in these applications. And what do we mean by state diagrams here? Yeah, I mean, we saw a lot of people adopting Cucumber and using Gherkin, but not really understanding when is Gherkin appropriate, what is it actually giving you, and how is it helpful? So one thing that's nice about Gherkin is that it, it, it asks everyone to think about their application as a state machine. Every feature of your, your application uh, is, is basically a talk, uh, an implementation of some, some state machine. There's transitions that are happening. There's a start state. There's an event. There's an end state. This is given when then. And why is that nice? I mean, it's nice for one reason. Uh, your product owner doesn't have to like, take a class in computer science to understand given when then. It's quite obvious. But it, it's also nice because uh, you're asking everyone to be on the same page about the complexity. 
if you like building overly complex applications that your users are going to hate, then uh, try a process that lets the product owner and everyone hide from that complexity. Um, and have good luck with that. But if you, if you want to have like conversations as a team about whether your application is too complex and what you can do to simplify it, then Gherkin is one way to get everyone on the same page about it. Right, so now we kind of have this common language, and actually we can kind of go in and we can go into, we can go from Tracker or Jira or whatever your kind of project management tool is, we can just copy that and paste it straight into our kind of code editors. And this is really important. This is a kind of loose integration, but we're using the same language. The, the business guys, the product team, and the developers are all using this kind of unified language, um, a ubiquitous language, if you will, across all of the kind of uh, the domain when developing an application. Um, and if you're doing it well, then you might also deliver on that promise of uh, BDD and TDD leading to living executable documentation. Documentation that tells you um, not only what the system does, uh, but also verifies that it's doing it at any given moment. It, it lives and breathes and changes with the application. So Gherkin kind of went from Cucumber and got adopted into Spinach and Turnip, and there's a bunch of other tools as well here. Uh, steak, Bacon, Feel Like Lemon, and a, you know, a bunch of other edible test frameworks. Um, but you know, there's there's a kind of lesson in here, and it's a it's it's a cautionary tale where again we're kind of not asking the right questions of the of the applications we're using of the test frameworks, and you know maybe we kind of start blaming those tools, and we get into a situation where we say you know this tool is not is not working for us. I'm going to go and build a new shiny tool, um, and then blog about it, and other people are going to like it, and they'll start using it, and they'll get frustrated, and then they'll build their own shiny tools, and you know we're just going to kind of go round and round in this loop here. Yeah. Um. So how do, we, how do we get out of that? We have to start asking ourselves, uh, why are we feeling pain doing BDD? What, what's causing it, essentially? So let's talk about some of that. Uh, one thing I think a lot of us have felt doing uh, testing is brittleness. And, and uh, maybe you're in a situation where um, uh, there's a change that comes down the pipeline. The product owner asks for a new feature, and it, it changes some assumptions you have about your application. And this ripples throughout your test suite, and all these tests start breaking. Maybe that's a bit inevitable. There's, pr there's probably no good test suite out there that can't avoid this. But if you're forced to go to each and every one of those tests and fix each one of them individually, then congratulations, you have a very brittle test suite. You've scattered your assumptions all around your test suite. Right, and the kind of the real problem with this is that you know brittle tests just don't reveal the intent of uh, the application. They kind of often describe how something works rather than what it's doing and what behavior it's trying to, uh, to promote. Um, so what do we mean by that? Let's 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 imagine we're 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 on the Twitter team and we're building Twitter and a uh, product owner comes to us and says, "I want you to build the tweet feature for me." And so maybe you think up a few scenarios like, "All right, well it could be valid, it could be too long, it could be a duplicate of the last tweet you made," and you you just go off and running and write write us some cucumber yourself. Right. So kind of, and this is something which we'll see very often. Um, it's very verbose, and you know we've had to kind of reduce the font size just to kind of fit this on, but. Kind of let, let's kind of have a look and see what's going on here. We kind of have to log in. We have to submit a tweet. Um, someone else has to log in. They have to go to the timeline. You know, it's, it's really describing the UI. You know, and words are not a particularly good way of describing a UI. Yeah. Um, if we if we dig in a bit, we can see some patterns in here. There's logging in happening in a couple of different places, and and it's not just happening like saying someone logs in. It's actually spelling out all the steps you go through in the user interface to log in. Uh, so if something about that flow changes, there's already in this one scenario two different things you have to update. Right. And you know, we're building an application on Twitter, so we're probably going to be doing a lot of tweeting as well. Right? And we're going to see that in the next few slides. Here we are on the uh, overlong tweet, and again, we can kind of see that tweet coming through. And it's exactly the same. And again, it's kind of scattering the assumption, and it's duplicating that knowledge throughout the test code base. Here's the login again. Uh, same for a duplicate tweet scenario. If you were the type of developer that liked to write this stuff, you're just going to keep seeing this everywhere, and you're going to lead to a lot of pain. And you know, may maybe this is the case where the tool is wrong. You know, maybe this is kind of written in Cucumber, and maybe Cucumber is not the right tool for our project. So you know, we could just write this in R spec, right? And now the, all of our problems are solved. Um, <laughs> nope. <laughs> You're going to feel all the same pain if you take this approach to writing R spec feature specs that you felt doing Cucumber, because you're doing the exact same thing. You're exhibiting the same problem that you had. Right. It's kind of at this point, it isn't the test framework. It's the way that you've been writing these tests. Yeah. And uh, so at that point, we kind of like to take a step further and uh, talk about a cautionary tale that we like to call big pats. Big rats leave big poos. The big rat is capybara. That's not just random. Um, uh, no, there's nothing wrong with capybara. Capybara is great. I'm just saying the way we use it, we got to watch out for that. So imagine 
You're, again, you're building this Twitter thing. You, you, you get a story, and some, somewhere in there you need to tweet. So at some point, you need to click on the tweet button. And so you just write some raw capybara inside your uh, RSpec feature spec or inside your step definition in Cucumber, and you say, click button tweet. Tests go green. You hand it off to your product owner. Next. All right, so I kind of pick up the next story, and I'm, I kind of start doing the same thing. And I'll be like, well, you know, that tweet could be a link or a button. So I'm going to be a little bit more cautionary, a uh, little less brittle, and uh, do the same thing. Tesco Green acceptance uh, happens, and then we pick up the next story. Yeah, and then I, I think, you know what, um, I'm going to do another feature here. And, and what if, what, I, I, I like what Robbie did, but, you know, I'm going to write click on, because it turns out Capybara aliases click on to click link or button. Uh, and so it's just shorter and nicer. Okay, i got one more. So... Uh, you know, the product owner might change the, the word in tweet, right? So I'm going to use an ID because I own the ID as a developer, but the product owner uses the content, right? So I'm going to do that and be even less brittle. Yeah, well, you know what? Uh, I'm pretty sure we're not going to be using semantic HTML for much longer, so I'm just going to start finding things by their ID and clicking on them because uh, I'm protected from that particular scenario. Okay, maybe one more. So I'm kind of a really, I'm really into JavaScript, right? So why not? I'm just going to pass JavaScript in. <laughs> Because, you know, at Woods Law, right, anything that can be written in JavaScript will be, so why not test too? Sweet. So now we, we've got our test suite. There, there's all kinds of tests clicking on this tweet button. They're all doing it differently. And our product owner says, hey, guys, uh, now every time someone tweets, I want you to pop up a captcha and force them to enter it in. OK, you pick up that story, you get it to pass, and then you run your whole build. What happens? Everything fails. And not only does everything fail, you're going to have to go to each and every single one of these tests and fix each one of them individually, because everyone did it differently. So I mean, one of the tricks that we can do here is we can kind of extract that knowledge. The, we can take the what and put it somewhere else, and kind of leave the what and sorry, take the why, or take the how, and put it somewhere else, and leave the what back in the test. And one way we can do that is kind of create a, a, a module, a web helper. We can have a tweet definition, and we're going to pass it a message, and that is going to have the, have the how, and it's going to have the filling in and uh, the evil product requirement of filling in a capture to submit a tweet. We're going to kind of encapsulate that knowledge in one place so that when we run these tests, hopefully they're all going to go green. Um, yeah, so at this point, you're really starting to like build up your own DSL, what your application does, and think in terms of your application's domain, not in the lower-level domain of a user interface. Right. And you can do this in Cucumber. You can do this in RSpec or probably any other testing framework you use, it's quite easy uh, to include this module and make them available to your tests. And it, it's also nice, I guess, because uh, you're, you're, you're going to start developing at some test framework independence, too, and, and leaving yourself more wiggle room in the end. So let's kind of take a look back through the Twitter example and kind of maybe kind of clean up our, our spec. So now we've got kind of given Bob has authenticated. When Bob submits a tweet, then Alice can see Bob's tweet, and Bob should see that tweet in his timeline. So this is maybe how you would have written it in the first in the first time round. So you, you visit the root, you fill in a username and a password, and you sign in. But you know this is kind of not really revealing the intent. It's talking about how it happens rather than what it should be doing. Really, we should be writing something like login Bob. Uh, where Bob is probably just yet another method in your web helpers, and maybe it just memoizes um, a user that you factory up. Uh, you, can, you can apply the same principle over and over again to all the other step definitions. Stop writing them like this and start writing uh, in the language of your domain. And kind of the big one here, so Alice can see Bob's tweets. So first of all, we need to sign Bob out, and then we need to sign Alice back in, and then she needs to look at a timeline. We really we kind of want to write something like this. So kind of log in Alice, and Alice should see uh, the tweet hello world. And you know, we can use some kind of custom aspect matches here to make this even kind of more readable and kind of nice to use. I don't know if Corey Haynes is still here, but he might call this uh, programming by wishful thinking, uh, where, where we basically imagine an, an API that we would like to have and pretend it's there and write it and let it blow up and then try to write uh, code to make it, make it actually work. So this is a cucumber example, but we can you know, just as easily do it in our spec here. And we've got kind of logging in Bob, tweet hello world, logging in Alice, and Alice should see hello world. So we're kind of starting to use that DSL under the hood, and we can kind of use it any which way we want. But we're building up that knowledge in one place. All right, so another way um, BDD ends up going wrong is you get into a situation where you're, um, you're not collaborating with your product owners on defining that acceptance criteria. And sometimes th this can happen for a number of reasons. Uh, one reason, I think, maybe even the most uh, prevalent reason is, is that you simply cargo culted BDD from somewhere else and didn't actually, you somehow missed the point that BDD was created to say, support a process of customer collaboration. 
And kind of another reason is, you know, it's, it's kind of hard. You're trying to convince your product owner to kind of change the way they're thinking. And you can ultimately kind of just actually just start annoying them if you start saying, hey, we're going to use this new test framework, and it says we have to write the test like this. And as a product owner, it's your responsibility to write me stories that, are, you know, correspond to my uh, test framework, which I'm using this week. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe you like writing... <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe you like writing uh, this kind of stuff, and somehow you, you you think that a step is some fundamental unit of organization within your cucumber suite, and it's not. Your product owner doesn't want to write this, has no interest in writing this. All he was trying to say there was, given Bob logged in, you should let him say that. You should build up an underlying system of helper methods that make this really easy to do, right. so you can spin up any kind of new step definition you need. Right, we should be kind of working at, at the kind of business layer. We should, you know, allow the business owners to use their language, and then we should transport that into our tests and not the other way around. So another way uh, Cucumber goes wrong, or BDD goes wrong, is you get into a situation where you're not, you're not delivering on the promise of living executable documentation, that your tests, uh, no one's reading them. This can happen for any number of reasons. One reason is the thing we've already seen, where they're completely unreadable. Uh, if I mean, it was, it, was, it was probably hard enough for you to write them. You're never going to go back and read them. Um, so I don't do that anymore. Another one is they're just not exposed anywhere. And, like, and if you're trying to get your product owners to give you better stories, but you don't expose them anywhere, then how are they going to learn from the best practices and kind of re-put that into, the, into their stories? Um, and you, you know, really, if we're using Cucumber, we can format our output as HTML. And uh, if we're using something like Relish, you can publish that up to up to Relish and kind of share that. And if you've kind of used RSpec over the last year or so, you've probably come across the Relish homepage. And, and that's something which you can use, and they've got like private and public repositories. But you know, if you kind of want to use a, a more open source version, there's Wally from the BBC, which, which does the same sort of thing. But, but you could host it inside your data center. So if you have that kind of security concern, that's another option. And I think another reason maybe no one's reading your tests as documentation is because you simply don't need to read them yet. You haven't needed documentation. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think if you're, if you're, if you're going through this process with your product owner and you're writing these things up together, you're getting at least 50% of the value out of that, even if you never end up using a BDD tool that supports Gherkin. But if you then use a BDD tool that supports Gherkin, you're probably getting the other 40 45% of value out of this process. The, the remaining 5% is that documentation. Don't sweat it. If it's something you don't really need at this moment, it's not that big of a deal. OK, so up, up until now, we kind of just really looked at problems which uh, you know, are quite, quite painful when you're doing with them at, at one particular time, like being able to read the documentation and uh, just having kind of more uh, you know, just having better tests which say what's happening rather than the why. But the kind of the real, the real kind of issue which which stays with us all the time is just the the slowness of the tests, right? Yeah, maybe you're in a situation where you run your tests and they take like, I don't know, 18 minutes. Is that a long time? Does anybody here have an 18 minute test suite? Three hours. Three hours. Um, okay. Any, 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 any? Can anyone beat that? I can beat that. I, w I was pulled onto a uh, rescue project one time and we inherited this legacy code base and. Uh, when we finally got the test to run, first they didn't run because the machine kept running out of memory because there was some kind of crazy memory leak, but we finally got them to run and they, they ran for 33 hours. And when the 33 hours were over, a thousand tests were broken. <laughs> so if, if, you, if, you, if you're on this path, be warned. That's where, that's where you end. Right. Eight, <laughs> yeah. 18 minutes should feel like an eternity. And the kind of the real point of this is that, you know, slow tests just you know, find a way of getting run less often. Like if you've got, if you you know, if you want to be you want to be running your test before you check in, but if it takes 20 minutes or 40 minutes or an hour or longer, you're probably not going to run those tests before you push them up to to CI, uh, to Git or whatever. And you're you're going to start relying on your continuous integration build to start telling you when these things are broken. And 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 that's a slippery slope too, because that's such a longer feedback loop, and and eventually you might even stop listening to CI anymore. And then at that point, you have to ask yourself, are you getting any kind of value? out of your test suite, or is it just a drain on your project? Right, I mean, CI is there to kind of be a confidence boost, right? And if it's not being used as that, then where's your confidence coming from? So uh, one thing we've seen when we pop, op pop open these test suites um, at the acceptance layer, some, something that we found is that you might, you might see this. You might see sleeps going on in, in the tests. And what's happening here, it's, it's really a developer has given up. That's what happened there. Uh, they were like, I don't know why it passes sometimes and why it fails sometimes. There's some kind of asynchronous thing happening on the page, and I can't figure it out. So you know what? I'm, I'm, just, gonna, I'm just going to pray. This is prayer-driven development. Right, because it works on my machine. I don't care if it doesn't work in CI or a Matt's machine, right? 
And I kind of run it once, and it's fine. And I run it the next time, and one test fails, and the next time two tests fails. And you know, kind of putting sleeps in your code is really the first step to admitting defeat. It is. Um, so don't do that. Uh, Capybara has, uh, for some time, had various facilities for dealing with this. In previous incarnations of Capybara, they had something called wait for. And it was, it was something you could use to basically pull your system for something to be true. So you, you said, wait for, you gave it a block. That block needed to return a Boolean. And when that Boolean was true, then the test would proceed. Otherwise, it would pull every five milliseconds your system to see if that thing was yet true. And eventually, it might time out, in which case that tells you something. But otherwise, you have a much smarter polling mechanism. Right, and this was great apart from uh, when developers like me came along and started putting assertions inside that wait for block. And of course, as anyone knows, that if you fail an assertion, it doesn't return false, it throws an exception, um, which kind of completely bypasses the wait for thing. Um, so you kind of think you're clever and you're like, this is going to work, and you just get no benefit from that whatsoever. Yeah, so I think the developers at Gabibara noticed, like, yeah, there is some confusion about how to do this. And they were like, well, why shouldn't every single thing in Capybara pull? Why, if, if it's not true now, just start polling and see if it becomes true. Uh, and if after some specified timeout it's not true, then we can throw the time, time ran out exception. And so they did. In Capybara 2.0, you don't really, you d there is no more wait for. Uh, it's, it's now like private functionality that you're not supposed to access anymore. And, and uh, because it's, it, it is at this point so ingrained in Capybara. So you might be able to upgrade and start removing a lot of these sleeps and start seeing a faster test suite and maybe eliminating some of those flickers. So maybe we've kind of done that step, and we still have a few flickering tests. Uh, one of the kind of tricks that we've started to see in the community is uh, like quarantining those, those flickering tests. And if you, say, add a tag to a test here, some kind of flickery uh, scenario, we can kind of tell our continuous integration server to say, like, hey, run all the tests, but don't run the quarantine build. Yeah, and then create a separate build uh, that would be kicked off after that that would just run your quarantine tests. And uh, this build could maybe even trigger itself if somehow it fails, and uh, and then eventually uh, do you know be, be part of your build pipeline in such a way that eventually you have this whole pipeline that'll go green and you can do a deploy. And one of the kind of the real benefits of this is that you know we need to kind of get those quarant those flickering tests out of your main build. I don't know how many people have had this experience, but kind of the CI is broken and you look at CI and say I was probably one of those flickering tests, right? Yeah, um, and then you don't check it out right then. Yeah, and you kind of I'm just going to press run again and then maybe run again after that. Um, I even had uh, one of my previous projects, um, we kind of, uh, you know, we had like four Mac minis that were all running uh, different versions of CI, and someone would just say like, oh, the build is broken, I'm just going to press it three times, and one of those paralyzed builds will probably pass. <laughs> 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 and you know, you, should, you know, surely that's the smell, you should stop doing that right there. Uh, so, right, it's a slippery slope, but uh, you can use this as a stopgap measure to start gaining more confidence and, and really just have a, an approach to isolating these things and figuring them out. But I think you'll need to, you'll need to create like a build nanny um, role on your team and maybe rotate it around. And the, the, anybody who's a build nanny should be uh, investigating uh, and time boxing the investigation of these flickering tests. And uh, if, if they can't figure it out, like why is it failing, they should either rethink it and rewrite it or maybe even just delete it. Well, Matt, delete your test. Delete it. Delete it. That's kinda, that test was green. Oh, do we really want to delete it? We do. Uh, I'll tell you why. This, this guy, Adam Milligan, um, he'll tell you why. He's, he's, he's one of the senior engineers at Pivotal and uh, just a really brilliant guy and he really kind of knows it. And, uh, he, he wrote something that we want to just read to you because he's probably going to say it better than we'll ever say it. So, Adam said, you should not be afraid to delete tests that are no longer providing value, no matter whether you originally planned to keep them or not. We tend to treat tests as these holy creatures that live blameless, irreproachable lives once they've sprung into existence. <laughs> not so. The maintenance required to keep a test running weighs against its value in further development. Sometimes these lines cross and the tests simply become a burden on the project. Having the skill and experience to recognize a burdensome test is something that we should be bringing to our clients as well as the fortitude to rewrite it, rethink it, or delete it. Thanks, Adam. I don't think we could have said that better. All right, so we've kind of gone through some of these tricks. Um, you know, we've, we've reduced the sleeps, we've done some quarantining, maybe we've deleted some tests. Um, now we have a nine minute build. It still feels like an eternity. Uh, so one question you should go ahead and ask yourself at this point is, why am I testing login 50 times inside my application? Or 500 times or 1,000 times? Uh, I, I, I'm willing to bet, I've looked into a lot of test suites that uh, have a lot of functionality hidden behind an authentication wall. And uh, in the acceptance testing layer, 
pretty much every one of those tests ends up clicking through the user interface to log somebody in. Do you need to do that over and over and over and over and over again? Uh, you could probably kind of get away with that, you know, just once, right? Uh, and again, like another, another thing which has kind of cropped up is this uh, notion of journey testing and functional testing. And this is kind of very akin to kind of black box and white box testing. Journey tests where you might just have like two or three, and these are kind of core journeys through your application. And they're going to be completely black box. You're going to start the application, register people, sign people up, follow, send tweets. And it's going to work from the outside in, and it's not any real knowledge of the system. But there's the, the, the rest of your test suite, the majority of it, even at the acceptance layer, should be much more white box. And uh, it shouldn't be afraid to um, fiddle, fiddle with the bits behind the scenes to get, to get your system into some kind of state so that you can jump straight to the feature you're trying to test and start testing it. Right, that might be kind of putting something in the database, looking at a cookie. Um, and one, one way that we can do this is, again, we can kind of start tagging these, uh, start tagging these tests. So in this case here, we've just said, this, this test is going to be an authenticated test. And then you could throw a before hook uh, in your test suite that says, you know, before any test that's tagged is authenticated, just stub out the authentication. How that looks depends on the way you implement authentication, but it's always a thing you can do. And it's something you should be looking for to do. All right, so once again, we have reduced our build time. Uh, now we're down to four minutes. I'd probably be pretty happy with the four minutes, but Matt is much stricter than I am, and he still <laughs> thinks it feels like an eternity. So it does. And I'm not going to run that, that test suite a lot if it's taking four minutes. Um, so another thing we can keep an eye out for is simply over-testing. So if you're doing outside-in driven development and uh, you're, you're doing this specification by example process, you might end up with a whole lot of scenarios that you want to go through and implement. And when you go through and implement them, you should be implementing them all from the outside in. That's great. But the question becomes, do I need to commit all these things into my test suite when I'm done, into my code base when I'm done? Uh, the answer is maybe not. It depends, but maybe not. Right, if we kind of look at this, I mean, really, we can say we've got one canonical happy path and one canonical kind of unhappy path. These are the kind of common paths through the application. And really, the other ones are, you know, just variations on the unhappy path through the application. And, you know, maybe we've used BDD and we've used these kind of tools to design our application to push that from the outside in, but maybe we don't need to check that in. Maybe, yeah. Uh, just delete them. I, I, would you still feel confident in your build if you didn't check the rest of these things and if you deleted them? Maybe yes, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe you do that and maybe you start finding, you know what, I think we're getting defects now that we would have caught had we not deleted those tests. What do you do at that point? What are some of your options? So one of the options you could do is maybe tag some of these tests as CI. So you don't run them locally, but you kind of run them on the build. So you kind of get the regression test, but you get the speed of running something locally. You could do, if you were running Cucumber, you could just have your default tag set up like so. And again, take this with a grain of salt. This is kind of like the quarantine thing where you don't, you don't want to be doing this a lot because uh, you can get into very tricky situations where suddenly you, there, there's stuff failing on CI that you would have caught locally had you been running it. So what do you do at that point? I mean, um, yeah, uh, you can, you can take, a, take it a step further. Some, so it really depends on the type of failure you're feeling at that point. You can sit down and address, like, are there other ways we could get confidence and address these kind of regressions uh, without really slow tests? But uh, one, one option that you may just want to consider and think about is uh, tagging some scenarios as no UI. Right, so we're going to use the kind of documentation part of a BDD and those tests, but maybe we're not going to drive everything through the UI. And I think there's a kind of common conception here that, misconception, that BDD means acceptance testing and going through the browser. But, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. We could kind of build a, build a tag here with, uh, with our domain helpers and include a class which kind of just uses the objects and doesn't go through the, through the web UI. Yeah, so if, you, if you're pretty good about using that DSL inside your test, then you can actually redefine that DSL on the fly if you want to and change the way, uh, the level at which they're operating. So maybe now you just integrate your objects together, uh, which will certainly be a faster faster sort of acceptance test than, than working it through the user interface, and maybe that helps you address some of the uh, regressions that you're feeling because this gives you that kind of uh, information that you need. Right, we've kind of retained the design element of that and the confidence level, but without having the kind of the speed be, uh, be a burden on our project. Okay, so now you're doing these kind of things, and maybe you start to get down to a test suite that takes under a minute, and uh, at that point you can start breathing again and, and uh, running your tests a lot. And that's a really good place to be in. You should always be fighting to get your test build time down. Keep it down. Don't let it creep up. So kind of in summation, there's, there's kind of three real key points here that we want to talk about. One is kind of fighting the pain. 
Like, you know, if, you, if you're having pain with these frameworks, don't just throw your hands up and just say, oh, it's the tool's fault. You know, maybe it is the tool's fault. And we're not saying don't challenge the tool, don't rewrite the tools, but don't abandon them so quickly. And, you know, make sure you're doing the right thing and, and using it in the right manner. Uh, another thing you have to try to do is, is treat your, your test code as first-class citizens of your code base and uh, give them as much care and attention as you would your production code. Right, and if you're using kind of BDD as an outside-in testing uh, framework, you know, you're, you're, that is a design tool, and you're going to push that all the way through your code base, and ultimately, kind of well-designed tests, you know, will more than likely result in well-designed code. Um, yeah, so lastly, just BDD like you mean it. Don't, don't half-ass BDD. Put your whole ass into it, and I think you'll be much happier in the end. Thank you very much.